Amen. Wasn't that awesome? Do you, do you know who that was? No, it was Vince. It was Vince. Yeah, some people think that was Bono. I think he stole it from Vince. Or maybe, maybe it was Jesus and he was singing to us, his girlfriend. Anyway, <laughs> let's pray. Uh, Father, we do pray that you would sing to us through your word, uh, Jesus, to your uh, people, your bride, the church. I pray that you would preach, Lord Jesus, and that we would be even your sermon incarnate. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus, of course. The name means God saves. What a great name. Amen. Well, because of the way the preaching schedule worked out, you know that um, our last sermon on the Sermon on the Mount was actually three weeks ago. So do you, rem do you remember it, Liam? Do you? Okay. Well, then I'll remind you uh, real quickly, okay? Uh, but uh, last time, Matthew 7, 19, Jesus said, do not treasure treasure to yourselves or to yourself on earth, but treasure treasure to yourself in heaven, as if you have two selves, a self, on, a self on earth and a self in heaven. Then he talked about pure eyes that can spot the treasure in this world. Then he said you can't serve God and mammon or possessions. So what's the treasure? Is it something that you can possess? You can't serve God and possessions. Next verse, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. Well, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his stature. By being anxious, you can't make yourself grow one more inch. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the nations, the Gentiles, they seek all these things. And your heavenly Father, he knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, as if that's different than our righteousness, his righteousness. And all these things, all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble or, or evil. Don't be anxious. Well, that's really encouraging at first, right? I mean, I'm like a bird, free. I'm like a lovely flower. <laughs> I'm, I'm like grass. At first, it, it's encouraging, and then you consider. You consider the birds and the flowers and the grass. At first, it's encouraging, but then you start worrying. You start worrying even about your worrying, and Jesus says, don't worry. At first, it's encouraging, and then you watch Animal Planet, right? Consider the birds. And you think, you know, many species of birds really don't live very long. And they seem to work really, really hard. And they do, gosh, I think they do feel pain. Actually, I just had chicken for dinner. So you consider the birds and you think to yourself, you know, poetry's stupid. This must be poetry. Just Jesus doing some poetry. Jesus says, consider the birds, consider the lilies of the field. So you think, okay, uh, <laughs> I just stepped on a lily of the field, and Jesus, did you notice that deer eat the lilies of the field? 
Then it gets worse. It appears that Jesus does notice. He even says it. Consider the grass so beautifully clothed before it's thrown into the oven and burned. Therefore, don't be anxious. If I were a bird, a flower, or some grass, I'd be so stressed about dying, I don't think I could function. I don't think I could live. I couldn't do any living. I'd, I'd be so worried about dying. To live in this world, to live in time, is, however, to, to constantly die, right? Every moment, we die to the last moment. Jesus says, don't be anxious about, about your life. Well, <laughs> that's easy for you to say, Jesus. You don't live in the age of COVID-19, racial injustice and police brutality. I mean, all you had to worry about was leprosy, Romans, <laughs> the occasional crucifixion of some Jews. Don't be anxious about your life, says Jesus. And yet every newscast, you watch, think about this, every newscast is a recitation of reasons as to why I should be anxious about my life. I might die. I mean, these are really rather remarkable times when, when you think about it. In, in the middle of a global pandemic in which everyone is literally terrified to breathe, we all watch a white man kneel on the neck of a black man as over and over again he says, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and then he dies. A lot of black folks have felt like they can't breathe for a long time. and now everyone's terrified to breathe. And if you don't breathe, you die. And Jesus says, Peter, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, and what you will wear. But Jesus, if I don't have any food, if I don't have any clothing, I could starve to death before I freeze to death. I could die, Jesus, I could die. Mic drop, into the argument, I could die. As if that is the worst possible thing that could happen to me. I could die. And Jesus says, Peter, don't be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, is not life more than food? Is not the body more than clothing? You know, for most of human history, that was a rhetorical question. Folks would laugh and say, well, of course life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. For the first time in the 20th century, a significant portion of humanity began to say, well, actually, modern science has shown that life really isn't much more than food. It's reconstituted, reconstituted chemicals uh, animated by uh, chemical processes. The, well, that's your body. That's, that's your life. Actually, Jesus, we now understand that the only real things are things that you can touch and feel and measure in a controlled environment. Actually, this thing called life is the manifestation of a uh, violent struggle to consume more food than your neighbor, the survival of the fittest, th the will to power, to quote, Friedrich Nietzsche, Jesus. In the 20th century, theology was replaced by psychology. Theology has to do with powers beyond our control. So for most people, that means powers that don't exist. In the 20th century, if you really had a problem, you wouldn't go to a theologian, you'd go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Now Jesus didn't ignore psychology and psychiatry, that is the chemical functioning of the brain. Jesus knew, he, he knew that a, that a bottle of wine could significantly affect your, your cognition. He didn't ignore the psyche, he just knew that, well, it wasn't all that there is. Richard Wormbrand, one of my favorite authors, he, he wrote about one of his atheistic, reading something in one of his atheistic communist textbooks, like back in the 50s, it defined the word kiss in the following way. A kiss is the approach of two pairs of lips 
with reciprocal transmission of microbes and carbon dioxide. <laughs> is, is that correct? Well, yeah. But perhaps that's not all that a kiss is. Perhaps a kiss is more than just a means of transmitting COVID-19. Perhaps a kiss hides treasure. Perhaps life is more than food and drink. Perhaps a flower is more than carbon and chemical processes. Uh, Isaiah prophesied saying this, all flesh is grass. All its beauty, literally its hesed, which means steadfast love, relentless love, its, its hesed, its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of Yahweh blows on it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Jesus, the word of God, appears to be referencing Isaiah in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, Sigmund Freud didn't think there was such a thing as the Word of God, so he considered the lilies and the human psyche and concluded that we're all secretly motivated by a repressed fear of death. And I think he's right about the, the fear thing. So maybe abnormal psychology is really just abnormal repression. And normal psychology is just socially acceptable repression. Socially acceptable ways of, of denying your own death. Think about it, what's a psychologist supposed to say? I, under, I understand your anxiety. I have knowledge of our repressed fear of, of death and the function of cortisol in your blood and your brain. I have this knowledge, so, so don't worry. Okay, doc, but am I gonna die? I, I kinda think I might die. I, I think maybe I'm gonna die. Repress that thought. Repress that thought. Take up a hobby. Buy, buy more stuff. Have an affair. Join some cause. Worry about trivia, but, but repress that thought like a normal person. Repress that thought or, or you won't be able to function. You won't be able to live. W.H. Auden labeled this modern age the age of anxiety. I've struggled with anxiety all my life. I think it's this inner conviction that I should be able to manage my life. Combined with this constant realization that I'm not managing my life. I'm not in control of my life. Dying is losing control of your life. And Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life. Now this is really important. In modern English translations, there are primarily two different Greek words that get translated as the English word life. First, zoe, from which we get our word zoology. Zoe gets translated as life, something like 134 times in the English Standard Version. It gets translated as life and only as life, or maybe a couple times as living, but basically life, it only gets translated as life. So when Jesus says, I am the life, he said, I am the Zoe. Uh, Paul wrote, the spirit is Zoe. The breath is Zoe. Psyche, from, which, from whence we get our word psyche, or psychology, or psychiatrist, psyche gets translated as life, something like 41 times in the SV, but translated as soul, like 43 five times in the ESV, three times it gets translated as heart, three times as mind, two times as thing, one time uh, as thing, and, and one time as being. Now pay attention. A psyche can die. It can be destroyed. You can lose it. But the Zoe, Hebrews 7, 16, is indestructible. 
and yet it must be surrendered like a breath. <sighs> Jesus says, why do you worry about your psyche? Is your psyche not more than food and drink and, and clothing? So what exactly is a psyche? Well, psyche translates the Hebrew word nephesh. In the beginning, God breathed the breath of life. In Greek, that's the breath of spirit or the breath of, of zoe. He breathed the spirit of zoe into dust, and Adam became a living nephesh a living soul, uh, in the Greek, a psyche zoson, a zoe psyche, a living psyche. So Jesus is the life, the zoe, and the thing you call your life is the psyche, the thing you call your life, your, you know, your anxieties and, your, and your, your fears, your judgments, your experiences, your accomplishments, your mental map, your adult body, that's well, that's your psyche, but God made it at first. It's that thing that we sometimes call a baby, and yet around the age of two or three, we took over construction, construction of our psyche. Jesus says, don't worry about your psyche. What kind of a psychologist would Jesus make? Doc, I'm, I'm anxious about everything. I'm, I'm, I'm so anxious, I, I'm anxious about losing my life. Jesus, well stop it. You, you need to stop worrying about your life. You need to stop taking your fear, your shame, your depression, your reputation, your failures and your achievement. You need to stop taking them so seriously. Stop worrying about, about your life. This is a cross this is, this is where the nails go. You need to lose your life, your psyche, and I'm here to help. We don't want to say, stop it, Jesus. You could do serious psychic damage. And I think he would say, yep. <laughs> I'm aiming for total psychic damage. To quote myself, Matthew 16, 25, whoever would save his psyche, his life, will lose it. But whoever would lose his psyche for my sake, the Zoe, will find it. Well, I'm just pointing out that there really is no psychological solution to your anxieties. Because you will die. Or you already have. So let's hope that there's more than psychology. Maybe there's theology. So why are you anxious? You see, the psychological answer is, you're dying. The theological answer is the same. You're dying or, or already dead. The theological is the same, and yet, and yet it's quite a bit more because life is quite a bit more than what you can cram into your own psyche. Jesus asked, why do you worry about your life, your psyche? Well, the, the theological answer is, we worry about our life because we lost it long ago in a garden. On the sixth day of creation, God breathed the spirit of life into Adam, humanity. And on the same day, a tree sprang up in the middle of the garden, the tree of life, the tree of Zoe. It must have looked just like, like this. You see it on the screen, the tree of life. And in the same place, in the same place, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it must have also looked like this because God is good. And his spirit whew, is life. To the bride of Adam, the snake says, when you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Which ironically turns out to be true. God even says it, Genesis chapter three, verse 22. The snake says, when you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But just before that statement, the snake spoke the lie. He said, surely, dying, you will not die. 
But God had already said, the day you eat of it, dying, you will die. That's the literal translation of Genesis 2.17. The day you eat of it, dying, you will die. I'm convinced that this day is that day for a whole bunch of reasons, but one of which is the fact that dying, we do die. Or, or did you not notice? According to Scripture, we're all dead and dying, even though we think we're alive. And so, of course, we're anxious about our lives because we're all dying. We're already dead. We can't stop it. We, we, why? Why can't we stop it? Why, why is this happening? I'm losing my hair and getting ugly. Why can't I stop it? Well, what was on the tree? Jesus. The life. The Zoe. Jesus is also the knowledge of the good. God is good. Jesus is the knowledge of the good, and his death is knowledge of evil, for evil is the absence of the good, which is the word of God and the will of God. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, wrote Paul. He, he is treasure. He's treasure. But how are you going to get him? Jesus is on the tree. Why do we take his life on the tree? Eve took the fruit trying to make herself in the image of God. She was trying to create her own life by taking knowledge of the good who is the life. The Pharisees took the life, the life of Christ on a tree called the cross, for they were jealous of Jesus' life, and they, well, they, they wanted to save their own lives. We all take knowledge of the good to justify ourselves. Humanity, Adam, takes the life of Christ on the cross, for we all think that we must create ourselves, save ourselves, and justify ourselves. In other words, we're all constructing our own psyche. We take the Zoe to construct our own psyche. But in doing so, we crucify the Zoe and everything dies. We crucify the good and suddenly no evil. Trapped by evil. To construct our own individual psyches, we break the psyche of the Zoe, Jesus, the ultimate man, the eschatos Adam. When we sin, we create our own individual psyches and we psych ourselves out of the kingdom. Why? Well, because Jesus is the king of the kingdom. He's the head of the body. He's our helper, our husband, bride of Christ. So where's Jesus? Where's the life now? Well, he's hanging on a tree in a garden. And where is that garden? Well, it's at the edge of time and eternity and it's in the temple that is your own soul, the middle of Jerusalem. We are Jerusalem. So Jesus is in you. I've heard that over and over, right? Jesus is in you, and Jesus is all around you. Jesus is the word of God and will of God in everything that's anything. Jesus is the beauty in every flower. Jesus is the Hesed in your flesh, in the depths of your own soul. So how do you see him? How do you see him? See, I think the way you see him in your soul is how you see him everywhere. The way you relate to him in your temple is how you relate to the life all around you. It's also how we come to know evil and the good. 
Jesus just said, you cannot serve God and possession. So how do you see him, the king of the kingdom on a tree? Do you see him as a possession? As something that you can possess? In other words, is the king part of your kingdom? In other words, is he something that you can use to create yourself? In other words, is the Zoe part of your psyche? If so, you know evil. And it's no wonder you're anxious because you're not living in reality, but a nightmare, sometimes called hell. So is he something you possess or is he someone who possesses you? In other words, is he the king such that you are part of his kingdom? In other words, do, do you create him or is he the one that creates, saves, and justifies you? In other words, does he simply belong to your psyche or does your psyche and all things with it belong to him? If that's the case, well, you've been known by the good and now you know life is not what you make it. You are what the life is making you. The good is not a thing you come to know. Well, uh, the good is the one who came to know you. Heaven is not a thing you conquer, but the reality you experience when the king conquers your heart and you surrender to his love and you begin to the dance to the sound of his music. And so you know that you can never be proud. You must always be grateful. You know that everything is grace. Everything is grace, and anything else is just an illusion called ego, or sin, or the false self, your old Adam, your own psyche, and yeah, maybe hell. What I'm saying is that humanity, Adam, has believed a lie, and so we've psyched ourselves out of the kingdom, each of us has taken fruit from the tree and tried to create ourselves. It, it probably first happened when we were just two or three years old, but every time we sin, we make ourselves king of the kingdom, crucify the king, trap ourselves in a false psyche, the illusion of our own sovereignty. And that's why you worry about your life. It's an illusion. And why do you worry about food and drink and clothing? Well, the woman, the bride, that's us, said she, she saw that the tree was good for food, so she took and she ate. And it was good, but then everything went bad. And the woman saw that, the, that it was a delight to the eyes and to be desired to make one wise. So she took and she ate. It was good, but suddenly she knew evil and they were Ashamed, so they covered themselves in fig leaves and self-righteousness. Why do we worry about food and drink and clothing? Well, because Jesus is the bread of life, and we constantly break him. His blood is the river of life, and we constantly damn him. He is our righteousness, but we turn him into laws, knowledge of good and evil. We turn him into a thing. We turn him into laws that we think we can obey, and then we try to cover our shame with good deeds, but all our good deeds are filthy rags, <laughs> evil. Why do you worry about your life and food and drink and clothing, asked Jesus. And Jesus knows the answer but we don't yet quite fully know the answer. <laughs> the answer is Jesus. The name means God is salvation, and his presence obliterates the illusion that Peter is salvation. Obliterates our old psyches. He, 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 he lets us live in, in that illusion, you may have noticed. He lets us live in that illusion for a time but not forever without end. He's the end. 
Okay, so why are we anxious? Well, we've been psyched out of the kingdom. And yet, the kingdom is at hand. It's all around us and even within us. We've been psyched out of the kingdom and into our own psyches like, like a prison. We've been psyched out. And, and the problem is we can't just then psych ourselves back in. Have you noticed that? You cannot fix your anxiety with more anxiety about your anxiety. It's a tornado of anxiety. You need a revelation of Jesus, Prince of Peace. At the tree in the garden on Mount Calvary, we all took the life of God. And at the tree in the garden on Mount Calvary, God gave his own life. And that's the revelation. God is good. And his word is good. Life is good. And now you know. Life is not what you make it, but God is making you with his life all the time. He came to help you lose your psyche and find it. He came to help you die and live his life, eternal life. So last time, we said that this, this world is like this highlights hidden picture picture, right? It contains hidden pictures and you get to find them. It doesn't exactly matter what the initial picture is. I mean, it could be any moment in your life. What, what matters, what gives it meaning, beauty, and life is the pictures hidden within the picture, the treasure. The key printed on the side of the page is the revelation of the treasure hidden in the picture. The picture is like your perception of reality, your psyche. It's when you lose your psyche, like when your mom grabs the highlights thing, turns it upside down, says, look again, Peter. It's when you lose your psyche that you begin to find the pictures hidden in the picture. It's when you lose your psyche that you find the treasure, and ironically, you find a new psyche, which is your old psyche, but now filled with treasure. Jesus said, do not treasure treasure to yourself on earth. You see, you have an earthly self. That's your old psyche. That earthly man believes that he is king of his kingdom. So he looks at everything as if it was all his possession. And so all the life has died. There's no beauty, and there certainly is no wonder or worship, for the earthly man is king of everything in his kingdom. Do not treasure treasure to yourself on earth. Treasure treasure to yourself in heaven. You see, you have an earthly self, and you have a heavenly self. You have an old man, and you have a new and eternal man, a new and eternal Adam. The heavenly man believes that he's, well, he believes that he's the child of the king who is absolutely sovereign over his kingdom, and he loves without measure, and so the heavenly self looks at every moment as the gift of the Father created with his word, his word of love. I'm saying that this, or this, or this, or perhaps this, is the key. the key on the side of every picture in this world. So you see, Jesus didn't just die and rise at one moment in space and time. Every moment in space and time died and rose in Jesus. Can I say that again? You didn't, or, or, or Jesus didn't just die and rise at one moment in space and time Every moment in space and time died and rose in Jesus. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's the word of God. 
through whom our Father creates and sustains all things. He's the good incarnate and he is the life. But if you look at your life as your possession, then for you the life has died and all the good has become evil. You're trapped in a psyche of horror which you think is your life but is actually a prison called death or hell. And now the gospel. On the tree in the garden, Jesus descended into death and hell, where he cried, Father, forgive, forgive. Father, forgive. And he delivered up his spirit, his breath, his life, the Zoe. <sighs> I'm saying that he can now be found in every moment of your life, your psyche. And in every moment of your life, he's asking you to seek him. Seek first his kingdom. His kingdom is the dominion of the king. Seek him, for in every moment, you see, he's fixing to rise from the dead, and he wants you to watch. In every moment, he's the way, the truth, the life, the beauty, the good, the meaning of your story. He can be found in every moment, but he is always found now. Now is the point that eternity touches time and gives time its meaning, its logos. Now is the point that you can know and be known by a person. Now is the moment in which you surrender to the music and you begin to dance. Now is the moment you lose your life and find it. Now is the moment that you love. Now is the moment that you breathe. <sighs> Last time we said that you can think of each picture as a frame in a movie. A light from the projector shines on each frame in the film as one frame is replaced by another frame and you comprehend the plot as the plot reveals the meaning in each and every frame of the moving picture. Because we've all believed the lie, we've all taken the good, because we've all crucified the life and, and closed the eyes of our hearts in fear, well, we don't see the light in every frame. So we each have pictures in our past that fill us with fear and anxiety. We each have moments, maybe even a lifetime of moments, in which we feel forsaken by people, forsaken by God, even forsaken by ourselves because yeah, we're learning, we crucified the life. With our memory of those moments, we each construct a psyche that we call our life, which is actually a prison. For with that old psyche, we hang on to moments in the past as sorrow or shame or regret, and we imagine, we imagine moments in the future that fill us with anxiety or fear. And so we're unable to live now, and life is now. It's, it's eternal. Consider the birds, the lilies, and the grass, said Jesus. They sing, they grow, they display the glory of God. Well, maybe that's because they don't fear death. And so they live now. And so they live every moment. We try to hang on to life and the life dies. We get stuck in a moment, unable to live now. We psych ourselves out of the here and now. We psych ourselves out of the kingdom that is at hand. But Jesus is the light and the light is eternal. Now that means that he can shine on all our moments, past, present, even future, right now. And I've seen it, I've, I've seen it in these amazing ways, time and time again, praying for victims of abuse, both those that have been abused and abusers. Jesus will appear in old memories as, as a vision. He will appear in the person's psyche, he'll appear in their psyche, and even reveal that he had been there all along. I mean, I have some amazing stories about that. We don't have time right now. But when they choose, when they choose to see him, everything becomes new. 
Where there are wounds, he'll reveal that those wounds are wounds on his body, his body and their body. Where there's sin, he'll feed them with his body broken and bloodshed. Where there's shame, I've witnessed him actually, well, my wife will have the, a vision, the person will have the vision, and they tell me, but Jesus takes off his robe so he's naked and he clothes them with his righteousness. No longer are they anxious about what to eat, what to drink, or what to put on. They're wearing Jesus. In every moment, it's as if he dies and rises with them. In every moment, they lose their psyche and find it filled with him. It's what happens every time you come to this communion table with a mustard seed of faith. It's what happens every time you give a moment to Jesus, every time you see Jesus in a situation, every time you say, thank you, Jesus. You treasure, treasure in heaven, heaven that is at hand. It's what happens in the office of a good psychologist. They help you die to your old psyche and see Jesus. A good psychologist is actually a theologist. I, I think Jesus called them pastors. They help you lose your psyche and find the psyche of Christ. The psyche of Christ is faith. And faith is the desire to surrender your life to love. Faith is, faith is Jesus in you. Into your hands I surrender my spirit, my breath, the Zoe, said Jesus, and died. He expired and then was inspired by God, and he rose from the dead, firstborn of all creation. You know, I, can th I, I think that you can think of your, your psyche or your body as a set of lungs. In the beginning, God breathed his Zoe into your psyche, and you became a living psyche. But you took over construction and held your breath. He, he breathed his, his Zoe into your psyche, his breath into you, but you held the breath. You held the Zoe as if it was your own and everything began to die. Before my father died, he wanted to teach a class on, on dying at church. But I remember one day he said to me, he said, oh, Peter, I don't know that I have really anything to say. And I said, Dad, I don't know that you need to say anything. It's just who you are and that you're willing to talk. You see, the way you die is also the way you live. My dad died of a lung disease. He couldn't breathe. The last thing that I said to my dad in this world was, Dad, this is the body of Christ. This cup is the covenant in his blood. And I remember I placed it on his tongue. And the last thing he said to me was, thank you. He expired carbon dioxide in this world. And God inspired him with Zoe in the next, his home. To live is to breathe. To expire and inspire the life constantly. It's a river. At his funeral, a friend had a vision of my dad walking through the gates, the gates of heaven with Jesus. And you know what? I think I was there. <laughs> I mean on the other side of the gates. Susan was there. My mom was there. All my dad's grandkids were there. The cabin in the mountains was there. The birds were there. The lilies was there. The grass was there. And I'm sure, I'm sure some of you were there because you were in his psyche. I mean, his entire psyche was there and breathing. Jesus said, if you lose your psyche, for my sake, you'll find it. You see, I am part of my dad's psyche. 
I am treasure that he treasured to himself in heaven. The psyche that you lose is the psyche that you find, except that it's entirely new because you know, now you know, now you see it. Everything is a gift. Do you suppose that you're part of Jesus' psyche? Treasure that he treasured to himself in heaven, even while on earth? His psyche. Well, you see, the, the, the worst thing that could happen to you is not death. The worst thing that could happen to you is the fear of death. It's the fear of death. It's with the fear of death that the evil one keeps us in lifelong, psyche-long bondage. The worst thing is that you would try to save your life, your psyche, and so psych yourself out of the kingdom and into outer darkness. You see, Hades is not a place in eternity. Hell is getting stuck in a moment Right here, May 26th. I remember watching the morning news in horror. I saw a skinny white man in a uniform kneeling on the neck of a big black man named George Floyd who kept saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And I remember feeling terrible for George Floyd, but I don't think I was scared for George Floyd. I think I knew what I do know now, that Jesus was actually in George Floyd. And so Jesus helped George Floyd expire this age, and in the twinkling of an eye, his father inspired George with the life of Jesus. In other words, he lost his psyche and found it. His kids, his wife, Yes, and his girlfriend, imagine that. Birds, lilies, grass, all made new and revealing the glory of God. So I don't think, as I first saw that, I was scared for George Floyd, but I was terrified for Derek Chauvin. I could see it in his face. I recognized the face. He couldn't breathe. He couldn't lose his life and and find it. He looked as if he was trapped in some painful old psyche, maybe from junior high gym class or something. And I was worried that he might already be trapped in what Jesus called hell. You see, it starts here. And it can trap you. Even after your, your body dies, And so I prayed, I do pray that Jesus will reveal himself in Derek Chauvin, even if it's in hell. And and if he hasn't already, I'm certain that he will because Derek Chauvin is now a part of George Floyd's psyche. See, George Floyd wasn't perfect, but, but we do know that he said it. He had surrendered his psyche to Jesus, and Jesus makes all things new. So why are you anxious about your life, says Jesus? What you shall shall eat, what you shall drink. Why are you anxious about what you shall put on? And then at the end of the sixth day, the edge of the seventh, he takes bread and he breaks it, saying, this is my body given to you. It was the end of the sixth day that they took him down off of the tree. And he said, this this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness, even the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembering me. So we invite you to 
come forward to one of the tables and you can pick up one of those little cups and then take it back to your, um, back to your seat. And, and when you uh, partake, when you take the little wafer out of the top and the juice or whatever, this is what you're doing. You're surrendering your psyche to the Zoe and trusting that he will make all things new. Because God is good. And now you know. Amen. With every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them, we lift up one voice to the king on the throne saying, Alleluia. For we are one body. You have made us your body, Lord Jesus. And that's heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now you can sit down for just a second because I, I need to say that there are people that will listen to this sermon and say, well, what Peter really means, what Peter is saying is that we shouldn't wear a mask. That's a little bit like uh, saying what Peter is really saying is that you should throw yourself down from the temple and the angels will pick you up. Okay, I'm not telling you to tempt God. Some people will listen and say this means we shouldn't wear a mask. Others will listen and say, well, it means we should wear a mask within 25 feet of those not in your immediately, immediate family. Some will listen and say, well, this means Peter is saying that we should defund police departments. Others will listen and say, no, this means uh, Peter is saying that policemen should be paid more. And you see, all of that is stupid. Sorry to get angry. But it's the law. Love is not a dead law. Love is your living Lord. I'm saying that you should do what love tells you and never ever let fear stand in the way. Consider the birds, consider the lilies, consider Jesus. You know, there came a day when he would die for the sins of the world. That's pretty unsafe, you would think. There came a day when he would die for the sins of the world, the day when he would be stripped of glory far greater than Solomon's glory. A day when he would be cast into the fire, and yet he trusted his Father, and he let each day's troubles be sufficient for the day. You see, I believe Jesus lived each moment listening to the music of his Father's love. So when someone told a joke, I bet he laughed loudest. When someone told a story, I bet he was the best listener. When the spring rains came, I bet he enjoyed them the most. When he drank a glass of wine, I bet he was the most grateful. When someone was injured, I bet he, he felt their pain. When he went to a funeral, he wept the deepest tears. When they danced in the courtyard of the temple, I bet you that his dance was the best. And when his father whispered, son, today's the day. He poured out his heart picked up his cross and trusted his father unto death. And now death is swallowed up in victory. Don't only live like Jesus. Live as Jesus. He is God in human flesh. He is love in a body. And you are his body. All I'm saying is believe the gospel and you will become the gospel. Amen.